because I'm going to preach a message. Um, so the, the, the theme that God laid on my heart for the year, every, most everybody knows, but there's a few new folks in here today, so hey, I get to tell you too. Um, the, the Lord laid on my heart a theme at the end of last year for this year, and it's a simply the word no, K-N-O-W, to know. And as you can see, I, I worked with some folks and got a bunch of words put together with our, our, uh, our staff and team, and, uh, and, and Michelle put together an awesome circle for me with all those words in there, and then the word no, and there's so many words in there. There's no Jesus, no God, no the Holy Spirit, uh, no peace, no your neighborhood, no faithfulness, list, know how to listen, uh, no love. Well, today we're going to talk about no timing, no timing. God's timing is absolutely perfect. Our timing is rarely perfect. And the way that we think timing should happen is never perfect. <laughs> but God's timing is always perfect. Some of you may have heard my, one of my stories before, but I, I was praying over what to share this morning. And, and I just it was laid on my heart that years ago, um, I... I ended up back at a church that I had left begrudgingly. I know none of y'all have ever done that. Um, but uh, I left the church. I was upset. I ran from God. God called me back, delivered me, set me free. I went back to this church, and I had to make amends with my pastor. Kind of had to prove myself to my pastor. And, and um, he never really made a huge deal about it. But before too long, I became a Sunday school teacher, and I started putting together a ministry group. I talked about that a few weeks ago with families and, and married couples. We did all this awesome ministry stuff together. But then one day we had a, 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 one of our team, she was the kids pastor and the youth pastor because our other youth pastors had quit. And apparently being a youth pastor is a difficult job. Who knew? Um, being a pastor is just a walk in the park. You know, it's just raining and thunderstorming. The park's on fire and people are shooting arrows at you. You know, whatever. But uh, it, it is. Um, anyway, uh, so she got up and, and I, I had no idea what was getting ready to happen. And, and she announces her resignation. And so this is a big thing because she was the kid's pastor and the youth pastor. Two huge parts of the church that now uh, her and her husband did together, and now they're vacant. Well, when she began to speak, I, I'm sitting right here about where you are, uh, Ivan, except for it was in Springfield, Missouri, and then it was a pew. But uh, anyway, <laughs> I, I was sitting right there, and I began to feel God tell me that I was going to be the youth pastor of that church. Now, I just got to tell you that I had taught Sunday school and I'd helped do family ministries, but I had not ever been to a class to teach me how to be a pastor, a minister, or anything. I taught Royal Rangers, um, you know, that kind of thing, but I did not have a clue what it meant to be a youth pastor. Most youth pastors still don't, okay? Just throw that out there. Um, but uh, I didn't know, but I just began to feel this burden on me that I needed to go talk to the pastor and tell him that God has just called me to be the youth pastor of the church. Now, if you know the, you, you, most of you guys don't know, but the history I had with the pastor, we were just starting to finally get to the place where everything was completely hunky-dory, and here comes Travis saying, you know, hey, I feel like I'm supposed to be the youth pastor. And I sat down in his office, and I told him, I said, Pastor Snavely, I said, uh, I, I, I wanted to wait. I didn't, I wanted to try to confirm. I'm just, I've never felt something so strongly in all my life that I'm supposed to come and talk to you and tell you that I believe that God told me I'm supposed to be the youth pastor of this church. And I don't know how that's supposed to happen. And he looks at me and he goes, 
No. What? He said, well, no. Now, have you ever felt like God told you to do something and then there was like immediately a mountain between you and where you're supposed to be? And you're like, I don't even know how I'm supposed to get there, but God called me to do this and every door seems to be slamming in your face. And and so the one guy that has the ability to put me in the position that he does not have anybody to fill the position, because I know she just gave her resignation, (laughs) and he tells me no. And I'm like, but pastor, he goes, here's what I mean. Not right now. You're not ready. I'm like, but pastor, God called me. He said, yeah, God might have called you, and I fully believe that God's called you to be the youth pastor of this church, but not today. And of course, God was helping to teach me some lessons, you know, on learning how to respect the authority of the pastor and and all that. And so, you know, I left that office and I was happy as could be. I mean, I'll believe that. Yeah, no, I was not. I was very upset because I felt like God had called me to do something and pastor was shutting me down. And we had a couple of other conversations and he told me, so in Springfield, there used to be a, the, the big Bible pastor factory called Central Bible College. And, uh, and a lot of students went there. And what would happen when you're in Springfield and there's all these AG Bible colleges, all these AG students need somewhere to go to church. And they need somewhere to serve on staff to get their experience so when they graduate college, they can go somewhere else. Because that's what they would do. And pastor said, here's the thing. I believe God's called you to be the youth pastor, but I believe that someone else is going to come in first. And he'll probably be here for about a year or so, and then you will take the position. Oh, it gets even better. You see... They weren't finding anybody. Pastor Snavely, if you want to use the term old school, I don't think that really fits the bill of how old school Pastor Snavely was. Suit and tie, you know, you had to have a shirt with a collar and slacks if you were going to be on the platform. Ladies, you would be in a dress or a skirt. Just that's the way it was going to be. And, and fellas, if you had an earring, no way were you going to step foot on the platform. This is, I mean, he was very, very strict on his rules. And he was interviewing all these people to be youth pastors. And they had uh, tattoos that they thought were okay. And he did not think they were okay. I'm not anti-tattoo. I don't care for them much myself. But that's not a no-go thing for me, but it was for him. They had earrings, and, and they had all kinds of stuff, and everybody, pastor said, no, 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 no. And for six months, I got to help fill in for the youth group. And I was talking with one of the deacons, and he says, because I was really good friends with all these people, and he says, Travis, He said, we finally come to the place where we don't think we're going to find anybody else. (laughs) That makes you feel good, right? (laughs) So in the next board meeting, we're going to have a discussion and appoint you as the youth pastor. I'm like, all right. Then I get a phone call from Pastor Snavely, like the next day. Hey, Travis, um, you're not going to do youth group this week. What? He said, well, I've got a guy that's coming up, and he's going to try out and be our new youth pastor. What? Hold on just a second. I'm telling you, 24 hours ago, I was going to be the youth pastor. Now I'm not. And I wasn't. And you want to see somebody start to get bitter? Ooh. You know, I, I've learned how to curb my bitterness over the years, but I started to get very angry and bitter because there it was God had called me and I saw that there was some time that went by and the timing was right and I was supposed to be the youth pastor except for I wasn't my friend Josh who ended up becoming a really good friend of mine became our youth pastor he served for a little over a year and 
Very quickly, Josh and I became good friends. I got him a job working where I worked at because we couldn't pay our youth pastor very much. And, uh, and so he came and we became very good friends. And I learned a lot from him over the course of that next year. But I also had some things happen in my family over the course of the next year that if I had been the youth pastor, I probably would have fallen apart. But God knew in his perfect timing that I wasn't going to be ready when I thought I was. So many of us think that we need to fit into God's timing. And yes, whenever Josh departed, I became the youth pastor, set me on a path, and now I'm here. Praise God. Uh, somebody say amen. There we go. All right. I thought y'all didn't like me for a second. But, uh, but God's timing is perfect, and it is very rarely our timing. And I'm going to try and go through these stories really fast. Everybody say, okay. Uh -huh. <clears throat> but uh, have you ever wondered if God was ever going to show up in your life, in your situation, in the problem that you were facing? That uh, God, are you really there? Do doesn't it feel like in certain times, maybe even lots of times, that God has forgotten about you and the circumstance that you're going through? Some of you may have heard of a singer. His name is Chris Rice. And uh, if you have Spotify or one of those things, you might want to go look up this song. It's a, it's a very good song. I wouldn't call it a worship song per se. We would sing on Sunday. But it's called, the title of the song is Smelling the Color Nine. What? Yeah, that's the title of the song. This Smelling the Color Nine. And so in the lyrics of the song, it says something like this. He's talking to God and he says, sometimes finding you is like trying to smell the color nine. Okay, that doesn't make any sense. Exactly. Sometimes trying to find out where we are with God in our life and trying to find out God, what God wants in our situation, find out God's timing, is, it just is so hard to comprehend. And then we throw in the towel. But what I, what I like about the song is that he says that he's going to worship God anyway. He, he, he talks in the song about how he sees that other people seem to have these awesome experiences with God to know what's going on. But for him, it still ends up being like trying to smell the color nine. And, and so we cry out to God for our circumstances and what we always seem to end up with in our lack of patience for God's timing, is we find ourselves shouting to God, you're too late. If you only would have been there. If you would have shown up, when? Then what I needed would have been taken care of the way that I wanted you to do it, God. But the thing is, is that we're not called to that. We're called to God's perfect timing. So let's look at these two stories. I've got a lot of scripture I'm going to read, but I want, you to, I want you to really absorb these stories. Most of us have probably heard these stories before, but they're really awesome. I want to pull a couple things out of them. See, in Luke chapter 8, verse 40, there is a really cool thing happening here. A little girl is dying. Oh, wait, that's not very cool, is it? And there's two awesome miracles that happen in the middle of this, uh, as, as a part of this story. Um, and, well, let's just take a look at it. Luke chapter 8, verse 40. It says, Now when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. Everybody's waiting for Jesus to show up and give them some healings, aren't they? <clears throat> and there came a man named Jairus, who was the, a ruler of the synagogue, and falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house. For he had uh, an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. As Jesus went, the people pressed around him. Here's Jairus. What's his cry? Jesus, I need your help, and I need it when? Right now. 
I need you to understand my circumstance. My daughter is dying, and then you need to be here now. And verse 43, it says, And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. And immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, someone touched me. For I perceive that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Oh, we love to preach this story. Press in. Touch the hem of his garment. Receive your healing right now. Because that's what happened with her. God's timing in that situation was the immediate healing. Without Jesus even giving recognition to her, all she did was touch the hem of his garment. But when she did, it caused everything to stop. There comes this commotion. All right, who touched me? I'm certain Jesus probably already knew who had touched him. But you know what we need to do whenever God touches us? We need to respond with our testimony. It's time to share. So Some people might call you a braggart. I don't care. I want to know what Jesus did for you. you know, don't walk around going, I did this. Uh-uh. You want to walk around going, Jesus touched me. Jesus healed me. How awesome is that? But in the middle of the healing, she gets, she gets healed. But everything that was needing to be taken care of with Jairus' daughter all came to a hold. Have you ever been in the situation where other people seem to be receiving blessings from God and healing from God and they're praying and they're, they're getting their miracle and they're getting their touch from God and you're still over here going, hey God, what about me? And then, verse 49, while he was still speaking, Someone from the ruler's house came and said, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. While Jesus had stopped to take care of someone else's need, he was too late to take care of the first need. Jesus, you're too late. While you were busy with something else, my world fell apart. What I needed wasn't taken care of because you were busy with someone else. One of my favorite phrases in Scripture is this term, but God. It's an amazing phrase that makes for an awesome turn of events. Normally, sometimes it's not good. But most of the time, when you read the but God statements in Scripture, you see that something bad was happening, but God showed up. And, and, and so Jesus is God in the flesh. And so, so here, the next few words are this, but Jesus, but God, on hearing this, answered him, do not fear only believe and she will be well. What is our job as Christians? Simply believe. Just believe. Only 
believe. God's timing is perfect. It's not our timing. It's God's timing. Verse 51, and when he came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter and John and James and the father and mother of the child. That seems like there, there's more than no one there. But think about that for a second. Peter, John, James, the father and the mother of the child and Jesus and the child. Right? When he came, no, sorry, verse 52. And all were weeping and mourning for her. But he said, do not weep for she is not dead, but sleeping. These folks know how to take a pulse, I'm sure. She's dead. Jesus, verse 53, and they, there's five of them in the room besides Jesus and the girl that's sleeping, right? And they laughed at him. Peter, James, and John. Now, now we're not just talking about Jairus and his, and his wife. We're talking about Peter, James, and John. You know, the guys that have seen Jesus do like everything. You ever met some Christians that have seen some awesome things, but they still just can't have faith in God to do something awesome again? It's time for us to start, you know, cleaning our glasses and taking a look. I don't even have my glasses today. Clean the mirror and take a look. God wants to use us to do awesome stuff. God wants to do awesome stuff to us and through us. And we are still living on things that happened before. And whenever something new comes at us, we all go, oh, well, you know, I know Jesus did it before, but I don't know that he can do it again. Hmm. So what Jesus do? The King James Version says he put them all out of the room. It says he kicked them out. Verse 54 says, but taking her by the hand, he called saying, child, arise. And her spirit returned and she got up at once and he directed that someone should be get, something should be given her to eat. And her parents were amazed, but he charged them not to tell, to charge them to tell no one what had happened. So wait a minute. What you're telling me is, is that Jesus was too late. The girl had died and everybody laughed at him. But he still grabbed her by the hand and raised her from the dead. Now, whose timing do we operate on? Is it my time or God's time? Now, this next Bible story, I think, is one of the most hilarious Bible stories in the Bible. It's funny. And if you don't think it's funny, you probably will by the end of this message. Um, because I think it's hilarious. When I read this, there's so much comedy in the next few words. Now, there's some sorrow that's going on, but anybody ever been able to laugh in the middle of sorrow? Right? There's so much, because everyone else is sad, and Jesus, well, let's just take a look. If you, if you got your Bibles and you want to mark this one up, this, this is when Lazarus is dead. Right? Or Lazarus dies and he gets raised from the dead, and, and you're like, well, that's not really a funny story. Wait, I'm almost there. John chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and Martha, her sister Martha. Uh, Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. So if I'm understanding scripture, Lazarus was actually a good close friend, of Jesus. So it's his friend. So it's not just one of the regular guys coming around needing a healing. It's a friend of Jesus. You know, how many of y'all ever sung that song, I am a friend of God? Amen. Um, but, but here is the word comes to him You, Lord, the, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. All right, now we're serious. 
Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, what did he do? He stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Now I didn't bring my easy chair, but I kind of got this idea that here's Jesus. He just got word that his friend is dying. Jesus knows that his friend is going to die. Not only is he going to die, he's going to be buried, wrapped up and buried and put in a tomb. And what's Jesus do? Here's where the comedy starts. Jesus is like, yeah, don't worry about it. Kicks back in his easy chair, puts his feet up and hangs out for a couple more days and watches Netflix. Okay, he wasn't watching Netflix. And you got to read between the lines to see the easy chair part. But I'm just telling you that Jesus was so worried about his friend dying that it says he just hung out for two days where he was. He's just hanging out. Like, you know, what happens to us? We, we find out a loved one is dying and we are moving heaven and earth to get there, right? And Jesus is like, nah, we'll get there in a bit. Well, it gets better. You see, they're crying out, Jesus, we need your help right now. Jesus is like, yeah. Verse 7, it says, Then after this he said to his disciples, Let us go to Judea again. Now, I don't know how much scripture you've read, but uh, those people in Judea were just not real friendly. They weren't real happy with Jesus. And the disciples, verse 8, says to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you want to go there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. These guys, they're just so thick-headed. They just don't get it. You ever have that family member that you're just trying to convince to get saved? You know, just, no, Jesus, I just want to tell you about what you... Yeah, whatever. I don't, yeah, I don't know. Oh, you got healed? Well, that's real cool for you. You know, I'm just going to keep doing my own thing. Oh. Verse 13, now Jesus has spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. Come on, guys. Let's think about this for a second. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Huh. Jesus has saved them all so far. He's kept them all pretty safe thus far. Now, I know later there's going to be more trouble. But there, last, or Thomas, he's just so awesome. Well, we're just going to follow him and we're going to die too. If Jesus walked off a cliff, would you do it too? Yes. The problem is Jesus would probably just keep walking. Oh, why is it that people can see over and over again the miracles of God, yet we still don't want to trust in him? Jesus, if you go there, they're going to kill you. If, if we all go, we're all going to die. Oh, it's just sad. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb Four days. Four days. 
you know, a little bit of this is funny, but here it comes. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Lord, if you had been here, I, ha- I wouldn't have had to face this problem. Lord, if you had been here, I could have received my healing. Lord, if you had only shown up on time. But Jesus, you're too late. While you were busy sitting in your lazy chair, my whole world fell apart. But Martha still had a little bit of faith that Jesus could do something. Verse 22, but even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Oh, praise God. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said, it, had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Again, you're too late. You were busy with something else, and I did not get my need met. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in the spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. You know, when I read that scripture, Jesus wept. I used to think that he was sad because his friend died. But as I began to look at this a little closer, I started to realize that it wasn't because Jesus' friend had died. It was because the lack of faith in the people that had seen him perform miracle after miracle after miracle. And here he is almost to the end. The triumphal entry is coming up shortly after this. Palm Sunday that we love to celebrate is just a little bit away. And he has taught and trained not only the 12 disciples, but so many others that have seen all of these miracles. And I can only see the heartache and heartbreak to see that he has done all of this training and they still lack in faith that Jesus can really Do what he says he can do. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he open the eyes of the blind? Also have kept this man from dying. The Jews had no idea what was going on. And then they began to accuse him. Something I've noticed in ministry is people have something going on, people that have something going on in their lives, and so many will just turn on them. They never bother to know what's actually going on or find out how they can help. They just attack. Someone is broken. I've heard it said a few different times, Christians seem to be the only ones that kill their dead or kill the people that are down. Kill their wounded. That's the statement. (laughs) Get it down here. We, when someone is hurting, it's like we run and we are called to come together and build one another up and love one another, not become accusers. I 
Oh, and then it happens. Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus says, oh, here comes the fun part. Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, this is where I like the King James better. This says, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. King James says, he stinketh. Lord, by now he stinketh. I saw a little picture of these dogs. And it was a little cartoon, and they said they were King James dogs. And they said, barketh, woofeth. Anyway, uh, so here's Jesus. And Lazarus is going to stink up the place if they roll the stone away. But, but here Jesus says, said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Come on, folks. If you just will only believe. Only believe. Don't come up doubting. Don't come, in, come up wondering if God might heal you today. Come up and just believe in the power of God. Hmm. So they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I think that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around and they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice because he only wanted one guy to come out of the grave. He said, Lazarus, come forth. Or ESV, come out. Come on out of there, Lazarus. It's a new day for you. Oh, and the man who had died came out with his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Oh, not only does he stinketh, he's still wrapped up. I've seen all these videos, you know, Lazarus come walking out. Hey, guys, what's going on? And this is what I'm thinking. <laughs> hey, you see it the way you see it. I see it the way the Bible said. <laughs> said he's still wrapped up. And Jesus is like, let this guy go. And here's what I want everybody to know. When I die, leave me dead. I don't want nobody coming and laying hands on me and trying to bring me back to life. I want to stay in heaven. These poor people, they were, everybody's crying over them being dead. And Jesus bringing them back. I could just see the conversation afterwards. What are you doing, Jesus? I thought we were friends. I was in paradise and you're over here. Come on out. Like, this place is terrible. You said it's appointed man wants to die and then the judgment. How come you're judging me already? Put me back on this planet. Ugh. Come on. If someone could play some music for me, I'd appreciate it. God's perfect timing. Four days dead. He's still not too late. He was there in an instant when the woman touched his garment. Yeah, we're supposed to push through. We need to come expecting. We need to come believing. We need to come trusting that God is in control and his timing is perfect. It's time for us to quit worrying about what our neighbors think or what somebody might say or think about us. And we need to quit worrying about the, those that laugh because we believe in the power of the risen Savior. You know, we, we get all careful about what we say around people. Now, I'm not saying we need to be offensive, but I'm saying that maybe we just need to let the gospel out and let God take care of the rest. Maybe what we need to do is only believe. You see, I, I don't know what it is that's going on in your life. But I know the things that's gone on in my life. 
I know that God healed my back. And once in a while, I feel this little tinge in the middle of my back where I was healed. And I go, "Uh uh-uh. Jesus, you healed me. And I don't receive anything back. And it goes away. Sometimes we face trials and struggles. We don't, we don't know what's going to happen next. But I want to tell you today that whatever it is that you're needing from God, if you'll only believe, He will show up in His perfect timing. So what do you need from God today? At the beginning of the message, I told you it was going to be a little bit longer. And if you need to step out in just a moment, you, you, you can feel free to do so. Because I'm going, to, I'm going to do this altar call. If you're here today, I, I mentioned at the beginning that somebody is here and needs a healing. And it's time for you to receive it. God's timing is for you today. And you know that's you. If you need a touch from God, everybody is welcome. Everybody is welcome to the altar. If you need a healing in your body, you need deliverance from something in your life. If you already came up and prayed this morning and you say, Pastor, I I don't think I got everything I needed. I I love that uh, when Brother Robbie Dawkins was here last week, he just had him keep praying over and over and over and over again. Hey, if Jesus prayed for somebody twice before they got healed, I'm not Jesus. Maybe, just maybe, I can pray for you more than once. But what we've got to do is come and believe in Jesus. Come and believe in the Holy Spirit. Come and believe in the God that heals, that blesses, that transforms lives. But we've got to come and believe. Heavenly Father, in these moments, Jesus, I know that you are talking to some. So Lord, I just pray right now. Lord, that if anyone here does not know you as their Savior, Jesus said in these moments, they would step out and say, I want to make you Lord. Because I know that there is no other healing that can take place better than the healing of our spirit to your spirit. But Lord, anyone that needs a touch from you today, I pray that you would just compel their heart to come and believe for you to touch them. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So if you're here today,